welcome to The Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. You're listening to The Skeptic Zone. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. Hello and welcome. This is episode 115 for the 31st of December. Brian Dunning here, filling in for Richard Saunders, who's on assignment in San Francisco. Of course, what uh, some people call on assignment, others of us call vacation. If you've ever seen Richard Saunders in a Speedo, you'd probably lie about it, too. Today we're featuring interviews by the one and only Maynard, including the brothers behind the Placebo Band, a fine product by yours today. And we're very pleased to bring you one of the geniuses behind The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And from In Big and Books, we have one of my best friends because he sold so many of my books for me, Warren Bonnet. Unfortunately, Maynard also interviewed me, and because we were kind of short on content, we had to regretfully include it in today's Skeptic Zone. And following that, we have our favorite person, Rachel Dunlop, with Dr. Rachie Reports. This week, Dr. Rachie is taking a look into the recent findings by the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia, and what you can do to help fight quackery in pharmacies. I'll be back at the end of the show with a little bit of news about some things that I've been up to that I think you might find interesting. But for now, sit back and grab yourself a bottle of Night Train. Oh, wait, this is the skeptic zone. Grab yourself a, a glass of fine wine and enjoy the skeptic zone. some uh, real scientists. Where are you from, sir? I'm from the CSIRO. I work at North Ride. Right. Now, it's obviously a pretty rough and tumble game there because you've broken your arm. Yeah, actually, I just had some surgery on my hand. Uh, too much typing. As we can see here, just look at the crush that's going on at the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. The Novella Boys and the cult of Rebecca Watson is just going off over there, isn't it? It is, it is. Well, they're superstars, aren't they, really? Stephen's mm. amazing. He's like a robot, isn't he? He's just like a walking encyclopedia, right? I love it when I listen to it, and he, he just says those things which cut right to the core, you know? He's, he's great. Well, and also, it's so refreshing to actually get a really a decent answer to things and actually hear the facts presented in a decent way. So much of the stuff around these days, is not. it's so difficult to get to the real facts without, I don't know, filtering, colouring, whatever. Do you get kind of pissed off with the way the media like myself cover stuff? Because we don't know what you're really doing. And we have to make up words that explain it. And often we don't get it right, do we, the media? I'm not a scientist. I'm just a smartass. But I totally agree with what you just (laughs) said. You know, it's like you don't have to be a scientist to realise that there's a lot of crap and there's a lot of false middle ground and everything like that. Just... Just getting the straight story, is that so much to ask? Is half the stuff they say about you wrong? We do so many amazing things, and I, there's so much more that can be said about the, our achievements, and I think there's a real problem with communicating all the different uh, things that we've done. So I was just talking today, I would love to see more science news on just in the normal media. I think sometimes things are almost deemed to be delivered to the lowest common dom- denominator, and if not everyone will understand it, then it shouldn't be reported. Well, I think one of the problems is that they want to try and make it sexy, and a lot of science is frankly difficult. It's doing things over and over again to get a result and find out what works and most people haven't got the patience for that and they didn't go to uni so consequently (laughs) they get a bit bored with it. Even solar power which is kind of exciting Mm. it's a long process to get it to work properly. A new uh, invention I find really interesting is Memristas. It's a new uh, it's a major new technology in the field of uh, circuit design and it's going to have huge implications but I don't I don't remember seeing it on the news anywhere really. Yeah well why isn't my phone smaller yet then? Yeah that's what right. good what is, is it? Get out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's the thing. That's, that could actually be something that they could actually even pitch. I mean, the technology now is really stunning compared to what it was 10 years ago. Mm. And popular culture is disconnected from the science that keeps everything running. And what project, what section are you working on? I have a chemistry background, but I'm mainly working in IT at the moment. I consider myself to be a scientist at heart, and I love to keep across what all the researchers are doing. So there's some interesting stuff. Well, it's the coffee break on day two here at TAM Australia, and we've got... Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Where are you here from? I'm here from Newcastle. Oh, which suburb are you from? Are you from the much-troubled uh, Callaghan, is it? 
I am from the slightly dangerous but not disrespectable Hamilton North. But, Bill, how are you enjoying TAM? What are you getting out of it? You've travelled all this way as a Novocastrian, so, you know, we like to get our money's worth when we come to Sydney. Indeed, yeah. It's, all, it's been fantastic, just hearing all the speakers, seeing all the people, uh, face-spotting all the, all the people that you listen to on podcasts and, uh, and see on the TV. It's been fantastic. Now, we've got the Skeptics Guide to the Universe guys over there, and just about everybody seems surprised at what they look like. And they really shouldn't, because they've only ever heard them, so they could look like anything. Exactly. You must build up a, just build up a mental picture of what a, a cool person looks like, I guess, and then you see them, and I guess they're even cooler than you expected. And, of course, you must be obviously impressed by my Spice Girls T-shirt. It, it is fantastic. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> right. That's very tactful. That's very tactful for a sceptic. And also uh, we've got, uh, you know, uh, Newcastle's token atheist here. Who have we got? Uh, my name's Brett. Hi, Brett. We've, uh, we've heard from you before. You run the, uh, Athe- the Atheist Society of Union Newcastle. What's its official title? Uh, <laughs> The um, Atheist Agnostics Anti-Theists of Newcastle University. You, you, could, you, you, you couldn't just make it a bit simpler, could you? Yeah, A3, AQ. Oh, okay. it's, it's very simple. Now, what are you here for? Is there a bit of an atheist bent to what you're looking for at the TAM Australia? Um, no, actually. I'm, I'm also the vice president of the uh, Hunter Skeptics. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I've got a foot planted squarely in both camps. And, uh, look, what are you looking forward to here? What's going to be the one where you're going to be, like, eyeballing what's going on? Oh, um... I don't know. I haven't really, I haven't really thought of that. I, was, okay. I just, I just wanted to see the whole thing. Unfortunately, I didn't get to because I got here at nine pm yesterday. Well, what do you make of everybody? What, what, what was, could you describe the sceptic crowd? Um, Come on, let, oh, look. I'm a member of the media. Let's do a gross overgeneralisation. That's what we do. Yeah, right. Uh, smart, uh, attractive, um, sociable, definitely, um, and partying. From what I've heard. Mm. And what do you make of them? Bunch of dirty thieves and cutthroats. I haven't seen a few pirates around. Yeah, I know there's a lot of that. And musically, what do you reckon would be something to pick to have? If we're going to have the music of Tam, what would you go for? I, I see the guy over there, he, uh, the, the, the Polish death metal fans over there. How you going? So we've had Polish death metal, we've had all sorts of stuff. What's your pick? Uh, I know everyone's going to disagree with me, and that is the essence of the skeptics movement. So um, I'm going to go Watercolor by Pendulum. Okay. Yeah, that's a um, that's a that's a dance track. Okay, it makes your statement. Definitely. But come on, this hallway in. This would be cool for a party. Yeah, it's sexy ass. <laughs> All we need to do is replace some of those regular lights with some lasers and uh, smoke machines. Good times. Well, we're here at the Brian Dunning Festival, which just happens to coincide with TAM Australia. And uh, you just had the book signed by uh, Brian. You're a regular Skeptoid listener, are you? I am indeed. I've uh, been working my way up from the very beginning of them all till the most recent ones. So, yeah. Have you got a favourite episode? Um, barring the fact it took me about four shots listening it through, re-downloading it, the homeopathic one is my, by far my favourite. The and, homeopathic ten minutes of silence. Right yeah. n- now, it, it literally was. So. Yeah. Now, was I'll, I'll, I'll get Brian to explain. Now, it, what did you do in the homeopathic episode? <laughs> For ten minutes. Now, <laughs> w- what I couldn't figure out is why ten minutes. You could have achieved that with uh, eleven minutes, one minute. Was it a dilution thing? What was it? Uh, yeah, you know, they, it all goes by powers of ten. So ten minutes of silence. Oh, yeah. Okay, and yeah. so you, that's why you downloaded it four times because you thought you'd stuffed it up, didn't you? Pretty much. Oh, is my iPod broken? Oh God, no. <laughs> you know. So have you ever thought of um, writing into him with some uh, abusive mail? He gets the best abusive mail. I haven't thought of it, really, but, you know, now the suggestion's planted. <laughs> and uh, is it easy to turn your friends on to Skeptoid? Because he encourages you to, to do that. And it isn't always easy to get people to listen to podcasts. Um, most of my friends are somewhat on the fence at a side of things, so I've gotten a couple of them interested in it. The ones I really like to get are the ones who are really deep in the... Um, you know, in the woo-woo side of things, wow. which obviously that isn't going to work too easily. Well, I've got to say, I'm probably the only, <coughs> only person alive who listens to the No Agenda Show podcast and Skeptoid and enjoys them both, and their brain doesn't explode, because it's difficult when you have both sides going at once. 
Um, right, yeah. You'll see, you look, you're a sensible guy, you're wearing a hat inside. Obviously, I can see why you wouldn't want to pollute your mind with any woo. And what is your favourite woo? I've been asking a lot of people this. When you see something, what's the thing that makes you fly for it straight away? For some people, it's astrology. For some people, it's anti-vaccine. What's yours? Scientology. My parents got into Scientology you, big when I was a kid. You don't muck about. Ah, oh, personal experience, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's just... Even, you know, when I was about 10 years old, it's just rubbish heaped upon rubbish. And, yeah. That and... Um, at one point, I live over in Perth. Scientologist came up to me, you know, had a bit of a chat. Went on holiday to Switzerland. The same Scientologist came up to me for a chat. Uh, the persistent bunch, I'll give them that much. Get under the house, really? Yes. Wow. Which, unfortunately, going, oh, I don't speak German and so on, didn't help me too much when they go, oh, well, that's good, we speak English, we're from Perth. So, see, that sounds like a conspiracy theory to me, which doesn't really fit into a sceptic's meeting. No, but it's a funny anecdote nonetheless. It's a good one nonetheless. Thank you. And uh, did Brian invite you back to the hot tub? Sadly, no. I got to miss out. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, back to the Brian Dunning Festival there. You're lining up there. Now, how did you get turned on the sceptoid? Was it a bet gone bad? I think it was just boredom to begin with and trolling on the internet. (laughs) And now that you're listening to podcasts, because I work in radio, I have a lot of podcasts on my iPhone all the time, I get bored very quickly listening to regular radio because it's like when you have an iPod with your music on it. When you hear other music, you haven't got time for it. I've got all these radio shows that I'm into. When I listen to anybody else's radio station, they're not playing anything I'm interested in doing. So do you, is it, is it ruined radio for you? Not really, no. Because okay. I still listen to ABC Radio. I'm really sad. <laughs> well, I work for ABC Radio, so <laughs> perhaps I'm one step sadder. <laughs> and uh, what turned you on to the world of Dunning? Turn me on to the world of Dunning. Well, the, uh, the, the Brian Dunning Fest, the Dunn Fest, as it's known. I think it's, it's a fairly linear arrangement. You start off we, uh, with Phil Plate, and he leads you on to Skepticality, and he leads you on to the Skeptic Guide, and he leads you on to um, Skeptoid. It's called, like, you know, booze, marijuana, heroin, something like that. Ah, so uh, gateway drug. Basically, yeah. That's kind of weird, because I came in at it from the completely opposite direction. I'm a uh, fan of Leo Laporte's Twit Network. John C. Dvorak does stuff with him. He's on the No Agenda show. So I listen to that, and they have their great out there theories that they talk about all the time. And that led me to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, which led me to Brian. And also um, Quack Quack Cast as well is another great one as well. So it's amazing once you get into podcasts where you end up. That's, that's, it's very true. It's very true. I mean, I ended up here. <laughs> and uh, what do you make of the uh, sceptical meeting? Uh, well, I was at the uh, conference last year in Brisbane, which is where I hail from, and this one's certainly a bit bigger. Mm, and it's in the Masonic Temple. Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, a friend of mine got a chance to go through the Masonic Lodge in Brisbane a few months ago, but I unfortunately was out of town and missed it out and got a very interesting brochure all about being a Mason. Wow. That could be you. You might have to shave the beard. I don't think they allow beards, do they? I have no idea. They, okay. didn't, they, they didn't go into personal grooming habits in the... Um, oh, well, it, it's a recruitment thing. That's yeah. why they want to put you off. It's, it's like the Scientologists won't tell you about what's his name, the, the, you know, the, the guy who comes down with the Thetans and so forth. I'm a bit out of touch on that. So. <laughs> Look, I believe the Skeptics Guide of the Universe is on in there pretty soon, so I'll, I'll, uh, I will no longer block your way to Dunning. I'm just going to get a picture of, of myself with him, you see, so... Oh, you want me to take it? Well, look, we're here at TAM Australia now, a man that um, I've had a few interactions with uh, over the, uh, well, it's only been about a year or so, but I've been listening to his podcast for a while, Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com, and I've just been uh, polling the people in the room, and I was also asking them a couple of questions while I was at it, and they said that, uh, two questions, um, do you go to bed every night uh, and kiss your wife goodnight and go, I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. Do you sign off every night like that before you go to bed? I do, because that's how to get her motor running. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, because you got the voice. You got the voice. <laughs> she's making that. The facial expression she's giving me right now was well worth that. <laughs> <laughs> and look, and she comes to all these uh, conferences around the world when you go. And like, what's life on the road with Dunning? The, the, the Dunning family. Is it a bit like the Partridge family bus? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, except without the without the, the all the fun music and the and the mus- music the, the colourful bus and boy, obviously without the brain cells. <laughs> and look, well, look, a lot of people here are suffering from uh, jet, lag jet lag and uh, heavy drinking. I have not had the opportunity to suffer from any heavy drinking, and I'm very disappointed because they promised me that when I came to Australia, that would be the principal thesis around the event, but uh, hasn't materialized. Also, you got contacts or your eyes that blue, Brian? Oh, I, I, 
I tattooed them, actually. You know, they have the injectable Whoa. tattoos into the eyes. Yeah. yeah, well, because it matches your shirt. You've got a really blue shirt on there. <laughs> and uh, I know for a while you've been trying to get a bit of a, a TV thing going there with the, uh, with yeah. the Skeptoid. Mm-hmm. How hard is that? Because I spoke to you about this in the first interview in that the X-Files, which was originally going to be a documentary series anyway. They wanted to make a spooky woo documentary series and they couldn't sell it so they had to make it a fictional woo thing. Right. How hard is it to go and basically do a debunking show, which kind of is what it would be? Yeah, well, you know, we're going the opposite direction. We started with an idea that was going to be for network TV and we found out that what the networks want is something that's basically sensational. They don't care what the quality of the information is. They just want something sensational and crazy. And that's not the show, the kind of show that we want. So instead, we're, we're redoing it for public broadcasting because there's, you know, standard, standards of quality there. So that would make it slightly more documentary and you wouldn't be busting into people's houses going, you're a bad person. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, and what is your one big woo again? Now, I remember you do like to take multivitamins when you think you're feeling sick, <laughs> which you've actually done a show saying isn't true, yet you still do that, Brian. No, no, I don't do that anymore. Not, okay. not since the show. Okay. Not since the show. I've, I've forced myself. You know, what, what it is now is... Uh, these magical fruit drinks and supplements that are usually sold with multi-level marketing programs. Yeah, now I'm not aware of them as much here in Australia. I'm sure we do have them. And it's, is it basically a form of pyramid selling? Yes, uh, uh, that's exactly what it is uh, in the, in the so US. You mean, you, you've got to get in early, basically. Well, you yeah, but not even that so much. You've got to be one of the original employees of the company who's you know at the top of the chain. These um, the surveys have been done, and the the best performing ones are still ni- more than ninety nine percent of the people lose money who are involved with them, uh, and that's the best performing multi level marketing programs. Okay, so when you're um, pouring scorn on that on your show and your website, yes. that's going to make people that are making money from that kind of thing pretty pissed off with you. Well, I'm not worried about that because none of them are making money from it. The, the, only, the, the only people who make money are the people at the company who sell the product. Uh. See, they, they recruit you into their program and they tell you that you're starting your own business or you're now a distributor and really you're just their customer. You're just forced to buy um, a certain allotment of their product every month and it's an outrageously overpriced fruit drink more often than not or mm. whatever it is. That's how the program works. They force you to be their customer. And would you have picked the success of the power band uh, in, like, 2010? Like, I'm wearing a placebo band on my wrist, so we've got a rubber thing you wear on your wrist that's got a hologram in it, and people think it does amazing things. Sports people tend to uh, uh, go with them. Um, I'm su- Look, you know, I don't know much about scepticism, but I would have thought that everybody by 2010 wouldn't believe such a thing. Uh, you know, I, I keep saying uh, I, I keep saying nothing would surprise me, but I'm continually surprised by things like this. You know, if, if you bother to look at their marketing for the for the power balance and, and all the related companies knocking them off, um, they use a they use a 75 year old stage magician's trick called applied kinesiology to demonstrate that it actually works. Where the stage magician can do some really simple tricks and very subtle pressure changes on your body to make you think you've got more or less strength, whatever they want to make you think. And Power Balance, they didn't even change the name of the trick. They, they, they call it Applied Kinesiology Shows Why It Works. It proves that it works. Oh. And do you think those sports people are naturally a bit superstitious because it doesn't matter how talented you are, there is an element of luck in sport sometimes that maybe they're more prone to believing in this sort of thing? The professional athletes you see wearing them are paid to wear them. Um, I don't, I, I'm not aware of any professional athletes that use them because they think they work. However, I know plenty of just regular athletes who are. I've got, I play volleyball, and in a lot of Southern California volleyball players, you see these power balance bands all over the place. Mm. Now, now, so you, you out, so have you run out of things yet? How many episodes of Skeptoid have you done, Brian? I believe 234, 35. Well, it'll be time to give it a rest then, wouldn't it, Brian? <laughs> get over it, man. Move on. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to be able to move on for a long time. I've got hundreds of ideas. People send them to me far faster than I'll ever be able to keep up with it. And you have people that do research for you for free because they love doing it, uni students and that kind of stuff. Uh, That must be helpful. But still, you've got to collate it all. Yeah, well, actually, the assistants that I have 
um, they look up further reading suggestions for past episodes. They don't help with, with research on current episodes. I do have a Google group that I'll send an email to when I have a specific question I can't find. But I, don't, I, I use that maybe once or twice a month. It's not something I use very often. Now, in the skeptical community, which I'm learning more about all the time, and I don't consider myself much of a skeptic because, you know, I kind of believe in UFOs a bit, Brian. You know, I, I kind of think that there might be a dimension that they're moving through and it's just something we see from time to time. I know statistically that's almost impossible, but, you know, um, do you begrudge me that? You know, that's, that's among the least harmful beliefs. Everyone believes something weird. Everyone believes something that's not proven by evidence. I'm sure, myself included, and most of the time it's completely harmless. I mean, you know, if I acted upon it like, you know, I thought they were coming to get me and I was making plans about my life, that would not be a good thing. But, you know, I, I just find it an interesting intellectual exercise. Yeah, well, you see, the thing is that it, it, it's a pattern of thought where you say, when you start to believe anything that you hear in the, in the popular media without re-examining it critically, that's a, that's a whole pattern of thought that can lead to other problems because... Now you might be susceptible. Well, you might be tricked into buying one of these power balance bands, for example. You might uh, you might uh, be tricked into using some sort of an alternative therapy that, when you get ill, that's going to do nothing for you except lighten your wallet. There's all kinds of things that people are susceptible to, all kinds of marketing, et cetera, et cetera, if they don't think critically. Mm. And when I spoke to you earlier in the year, we spoke about atheism and that, and do you think most skeptics are actually atheists or not? Uh, in my experience, yeah, the vast majority are. And y- y- there's, a lo- there's a lot of crossover between the atheist community and the skeptical community. I, I-, I hate to use the word community because it makes us sound like a cult. But, you know, basically scientific skepticism is looking at things like this power balance and these bizarre claims that are in pop culture. And atheist activism is about telling people that their God's not real. Those are two different things, in, in, in my opinion. Mm. And, uh, yeah, and also, you know, you can piss people off when you tell them that their deity doesn't exist as well. Oh, sure. Um, it, I, you know, I, I, like to, I like to pick my battles, and I don't want to turn off most of my audience by saying, first, in order to listen to me, you've got to hate religious people. Mm. Um, I don't do that. I know a lot of other um, a lot of other skeptical outreach professionals, they do do that. They, they conflate atheism with skepticism, and uh, that's not the way I roll. Mm. And uh, what do you reckon are the chances of this show getting picked up, this TV show? You know, I don't think they're half bad. Um, Dr. Pamela Gay, who's our, our grant writer, she keeps us in check with very realistic expectations for how likely it is to get any of these specific federal grants that we're going after. But I'm really optimistic. Also, I spent a lot of money personally making the pilot, so I'm telling myself that I'm optimistic. Yeah, and how many pilots is that you've made now? Like, as someone who's the veteran of making lots of pilots that have never got picked up, um, I know how disappointing it can be. How's it been for you? I mean, because you go, uh, uh, and then, uh, uh. Well, so so far, that's the only that's the only pilot that I've been involved in, one that I had to pay for and make myself. Um, but uh, I will gladly take any other offers that come my way because I'd love for uh, something to stick to the wall. Well, yeah, because I've got to say, um, I wouldn't imagine you'd be uh, like, uh, what's your principal income? I mean, I could imagine is Skeptoid your principal income? I mean, uh, did, did, have you got a rich uncle somewhere, Brian? I, I don't want to see your bank account, but <laughs> I just, I just think, yeah, that, I, I don't know too many people that survive on their podcast. Yeah, no, that's that, that's that's true. It's most of my time and uh, almost none of my income. I'm, I'm my, my background is in computer science, and I still have some some uh, leftover computer science work that I do, some consulting and so forth. Are you a muso as well? Uh, not really. I've, I've, got a, I've got an old synthesizer in my closet that I played a lot in college. <laughs> well, we, we, everyone, we did a lot of things in college, you know. I mean, and, and it's good to see you've still got it there. And how does your um, long-suffering family put up with Dad the Skeptic? Oh, d- kids, no, that, that's not based in science. Don't do that. Oh, thanks, Dad. You just ruined us. <laughs> Our friends think we're uncool now. Yeah. How does the family handle it? They, they, they love it. And actually, all my kids, when they play the podcast for their friends, their friends love it, too. So it, it goes over very, very well. And I must thank you for doing a, uh, a message for me when I did Skeptics in the Pub. You, uh, you, gave, you gave a warning to everybody. And I was able to find some pictures online of you busting a move in a lobby somewhere, a conference. You were doing these really wild dance moves. They're on, they're on Google. You just put Brian Dunning dancing in, and there's you in a foyer doing all these really wild moves. That, that terrifies me. I have no idea yeah, what that I, is. I think it was from DragonCon or something. Ah, uh, well, it wouldn't surprise me at all in that case. Yeah, DragonCon, who knows? 
knows? Now, here's your chance to get your message out to the world here. Now, what do you reckon people should keep an eye out for? What's the latest woo that's come along that's just around the corner that we might not have spotted yet? You know, that's the thing. Uh, take a look next time you're out in the street reading a magazine, looking at signs on the street, whatever it is. Take a look and see what, what people are promoting. See if you can find something that may not necessarily have any science behind it. Uh, it's much more prolific than you think. You just have to be aware and keep an eye out for it. Once you do that, uh, you're going to find out that there's really fascinating science behind really fascinating things, and, and that's what I love to bring to people with my show. Can you do your sign-off, man? Because you've got to do the sign-off. And, I, and I'm sure, you know, when you kiss your wife goodnight, you go, I'm bro- get, do it, go on. You're listening to Skeptoid. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. <laughs> Look, I'm just talking with one of the uh, skeptics guide to the universe. We have this is Jay. Jay, and look, uh, are you a shill for Big Pharma? I absolutely am. Yeah. Great, because I'd like some dexamphetamine and a bucket of Ritalin to take away. You got that kind of stuff at the back there? Yeah, I got it in the uh, hotel room. We'll just talk. We'll pop over there, and I'll get it to you. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, I love Big Pharma. I'm, I'm, if I run into a shill, it's great. I know they're going to have that kind of stuff lying around, and I don't know why people give it a bad rap. Well, I'll tell you what. Look, the bottom line is Big Pharma exists. Everybody, Everybody's buying medication. We're, we're a very medicated society. And uh, the, we, we've admitted on the show, like, we know that there are things that Big Pharma does that, uh, that sometimes... Look, the, the, and I they found that refreshing. You were interviewing... Who was it the other week who was saying that on the show? I, I can't remember. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm incredibly jet-lagged. Yeah. <laughs> and it was mainly, yeah, and he was saying regulation's the problem. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, you know, any big corporation, I don't care what you're selling, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with just medication. It has to do with every big company, the regulations are, are there, and the regulations are there for a reason, because big companies tend to continue to want to grow and make more money and take advantage of opportunity. So why wouldn't Big Pharma do it? They do, but that's why we do have regulations, I and mean, they do get caught doing things, and we do talk about it. Now, uh, you were caught doing things, and you were, well, you were bigger than Big Pharma, doing a Skeptic's Guide to the Universe live in front of... Three million people in the uh, Masonic Temple of Sydney had that film. It was great. Yeah, the audience was great. There was, we had a really good vibe in the room. Uh, it seemed like everybody had a good time, but we loved doing our live shows. Only thing missing, because it was a Masonic term, temple, and you would get the Flintstone reference, a grand poobah hat, you know, yeah. the big hat with the horns. Someone should have had that. Yeah, but the, those aren't actually Masons. Those are... Ah. Yeah. Those are uh, another, like an offshoot. The Lord Order of the Buffalo. Or yeah. Something. yeah. <laughs> those are the Shriners, I think, where oh, those. okay. Yeah. Well, see, we get confused. We see you Americans doing stuff, and we just think you all do it. <laughs> you know, like you think we all have big spiders around the house. <laughs> well, i got to tell you, though, I saw a giant spider at the, uh, the Botanical Gardens, and I, it was bigger than... Uh, and was uh, it a... Well, it might have been an African one, but... Well, it wasn't, it wasn't poisonous. Somebody walked by and said it wasn't poisonous. But, it, you know, they're intimidating. I don't like big spiders. <laughs> what? Are you an arachnophobe? No, definitely not. But it, you know, anything anything big with big claws like or big those big spider teeth, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Look, now you can have a lie down. You got the big party on the boat tonight. Yeah, are you going to be there? Uh, well, no. Um, I was invited to play the part of Captain Stubing on the boat, but I, I thought no, no. no. Okay. So, but remember, what happens on the boat stays on the boat. That's right. <laughs> you okay. got it. I'll be talking to you guys tomorrow, and great to see you here. And do you think you'll ever? lose most of your life and travel to Australia again on a plane for that long? Definitely. I think uh, maybe about two years, I think, we'll do it again. Wow, that's great. See you then. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, no doubt all of you out there have a power balance band and you've noticed how it has changed your life beyond belief. I've got some guys here that are from a place far, far away that you will probably never visit, Western Australia, and they've... uh, done the placebo band which i have a couple of them i've got i'm wearing three and only two of them on my wrists hi guys how are you what are you uh, tell us who you are uh, i'm tom croucher and this is my brother nick croucher hello and uh, nick's got the uh, pork pie look he's got the uh, the specials look from the early 80s there not quite scar but it's, it's got a scar look it's scar mixed with a bit of billy joel uh <laughs> look you got going there yeah it's covering up my scars right <laughs> and uh can we have a comment on my t-shirt I was trying to think of one. Um, it's it's scary and babyish all at once. No, I, mm. <laughs> I know. I think you're flagging and I failing. Know. Look, I, I try and get a reaction out of the skeptics by putting my hand up for UFOs yesterday, yes, only you. person in the room, mm-hmm. and wearing a Spice Girls T-shirt the next day. Yes. What, what are you going to do to get a rise out of you people? Um. <laughs> <laughs> That'll look, about do it, I but, think. But look, let's no. stick to the topic here. Now, why did you decide to do your own placebo bands? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I see lots of dumb ideas every day, but I don't, I don't go out and manufacture my own version of them. Um, probably because we're a little bit dumb. No. Uh, 
<laughs> it was something we wanted to we that we didn't want to do a podcast because um, there's plenty of them and they're done really well. We wanted to get something together. We're really lazy bloggers, and uh, this seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, we, Nick found out how much it would cost us to do, and it seemed feasible, so we did it. And uh, what's been the reaction to having your own placebo bands? Because it's still, look, even because I'm like, you know, a paraskeptic, I'm the, the goosey skeptic, but even to me, in the 21st century, the fact that you could wear a rubber thing on your wrist with some sort of hologram like we have on our money, in which case we should all be lucky because there's holograms on our money, that someone will fall for that. So, I mean, yeah, you guys must have thought, hey, there's fields wide open here. Yeah, it was pretty much an easy target. Um, pretty easy to do as well. The approach, probably the same manufacturer, so they already had them made. We got them changed a little bit so that they were honest and truthful and said placebo instead of power and balance. Um, and then that's basically it, and they've taken off. Um, skeptics everywhere from all around the world are ordering them. Um, I have had sleepless nights putting them into little postage packs and sending them off everywhere, filling out all the forms. Um, and it's been great. It's been great. But I do want my life back, so now Tom is going to have to fill out all the forms. So how many have you sold? Um, we're on to our third batch of... We were going to initially try and get, like, 500, and then the factory said you had to have 1,000. So we got 1,000, and we managed to get Oz Skeptics to take some, which was nice. Wow. And then um, we're up to our third batch of 1,000, so... We are actually, we have sold a total of around 2,600 already, including uh, 800 special TAM Australia 2010 ones that have been given out here at TAM. Um, and we've got another 1,600 on the way. Now, that, that may be the last run we do, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. If the demand is there, I guess we, we will try to provide. So you've covered your costs, and uh, what are you doing with the profits? I imagine being sceptics, you're probably drinking it. Yeah, no. Um, actually, we put the word out. We didn't have any ideas what we were going to do with it. We just said, oh, we, we don't. We'll, we'll have, uh, take suggestions. And so we um, donated. Hook. So um, hookers and blow never came up? It did, but uh, we didn't. <laughs> we put it to a vote. It did, and it, it we didn't, didn't tell anyone. No, yes, it, did, it, did, it didn't get past the line on a vote basis, unfortunately. No, uh, we um, have ma- managed to donate um, 500 US to Rotary's polio eradicate polio eradicate campaign polio campaign which was cool um what we do with the next little bit of profits because we're only making a little bit just round just for rounding and stuff um we don't know we, we just sort of donate to who we feel like whoever's a well good cause well what i like is being skeptics you're, you're donating to a uh, a pro-vaccination cause Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That, that, that's what. Uh, that's what the. Uh, I think it was all the guys from the Stop AVN got on our website and said, "Please donate to this." So oh. we. Need- okay, now let's uh, do the plug. Where can the guy? Where can we listen to your podcast or your blog? What do you got out there? Okay, uh, it's at uh, skepticbros dot com. Um, there's links to the store. There's links to the blog. Although we haven't put anything on the blog for a while, um, you can catch us on Facebook if you look for Placebo Band. Um, yeah, there's lots of stuff on there. It's great. <laughs> now, something I've been asking all the sceptics here, most of it will end up on the cutting room floor because it, it, I've been asking so many people. What is the particular woo that, that really gets you guys burnt up? Obviously, the power balance band was one of them and the fact that people can wear something on their wrist and be more powerful. As sceptics, when you see something, the thing you've got to really hold yourself back from being rude about busting. Pregnant mare you're on. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're thinking about looking into um, a, a bit more. It, it, a lot of skeptic stuff uh, concentrates on um, human um, things, but there's a, a lot of animal woo out there, and um, yeah, there's just as many treatments for animals as there is for people. So I'm going to have a squid at that maybe a bit later, but um, ah. we're going to do heaps of different other stuff. So you might get into the uh, psychic pet stuff, and you might get into the uh, well. There's homeopathy for animals; they've got that going, and uh, the people that and, and people that um, it's not even and there's not even psychiatry for animals. It's uh, like people can read that. Like, is it telepaths or, or what, what do these people do that go to your animal and they can tell what it's? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's pretty weird. Um. <laughs> so, so there's, there's people that, that can do the like the Leonard Nimoy. They can do a mind meld with your cat. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know the cat will come in and say, um, "I'm hungry and I need to sleep." 
now. Thanks. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you also feel that the animal woo should be investigated? Uh, I might leave that up to Tom. Um, <laughs> look, what really uh, but, 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 you, but, you, but you got the hat. You could easily be from the No Agenda Agency with that hat. If you walked in and said, I'm on a mission from Adam Curry and John C. Dvorak, people would just throw their hands in the air and go, what do you want? Because the hat. You've got yeah, it. It's yeah. the FBI it, hat. It does open many doors and sometimes secret doors that I didn't even know existed. And by the way, we do have two No Agenda Show listeners here that you know, I've kind of bumped into there. Now, like myself, I find that you know they're out there there and that like that and like skip this guy of the universe i listen to both of them and get really confused but i enjoy the confusion yes yes that's oh uh, that's i do enjoy that um, it took me a long while to listen to my first uh, no agenda podcast i think they what do they run for two three hours yeah, or, yeah well yeah. They, they get on them bank it's at least an hour and a half and they, yeah. do, they do it twice a week and look you know and what they what they do is like nothing to do with scepticism. It's very entertaining. Uh, they're not all that interested in the evidence evidence based stuff, but they talk about an earthquake machine. Man, I love the idea. Of, if there was an earthquake machine, I want one. It's not all you know. As skeptics, we come to the conference. We're talking about skepticism and stuff, and generally that's our bent. But it's not always all skepticism, one hundred percent of the time. I mean, you know watch the goodies and television and different TV shows and love Doctor Who and get into no agenda and weird ideas just like everyone else. Yeah, so. yeah. and but look, what's your little dabbling in the, uh, the, in the dark arts? Oh, in the dark arts, yeah. my little dabbling. Um, that's Cause, a cause, good question. Because everyone's, everyone's got their own bit of woo, everyone's got their own bit of woo I mean, even Brian Dunning takes Molly vitamins when he feels he's getting sick. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a new book out at the moment. Now, it isn't one that um, everybody is going to be rushing for, but it's one that we haven't seen in Australia. I don't know if we have at all. Who have we got here? You're the guy who put it together. Uh, my name is Warren Bonnet, and uh, we don't have anything quite like it. So there's never been an atheist uh, short story compendium in Australia ever? Uh, not to my knowledge. The, uh, the only... Um, really prominent books that have come out on, on atheism in Australia. F- Philip Adams's, uh, Robin Williams did one, Terry Lane did one. Uh, there's a, a number of uh, self-published books too by uh, people like Brian Baker, um, but uh, no, nothing quite like this. So maybe there's not a demand for it. Are you going to send yourself broke doing this <laughs> sort of project? Well, the, the immediate uh, the demand so far seems to have been very high. Um, uh, I run a bookshop, a science bookshop up in uh, Queensland, and it's now our best-selling book by a long way. Right. Mm. And what sort of people did you rope in for it, and how hard was it to get people for it? Did anyone say, oh, no, mate, I don't want to be part of that? Uh, a couple of people said uh, no, um, but they also expressed their regrets that they couldn't uh, com- uh, contribute to it. But um, you know, most of the people that we approached were very positive about it. I, I approached about 80 people in total, uh, a little over uh, 50 uh, to 60 um, sent me something um, based upon a brief I set them and um, we selected 33. A lot of people, including my parents, have still got a problem with atheism because they ask, well, what do you guys believe in? And that's not the right question, is it? No, not really. It's, uh, it's not so much about what we believe in, but we're ex- simply expressing a desire that uh, a belief in something supernatural shouldn't form such a prominent place in things like public policy and politics. And it's only really in the last few years, and let's face it, since 9-11, that uh, atheists have started to come out of the woodwork a bit. Because I think before then, we all sort of had an unwritten agreement um, believers and non-believers alike that you know you you can believe your thing that's fine Um, we don't and we think it's a little bit silly but that's okay Uh, and one day it'll wear away and and there seemed to be this sort of unwritten agreement about it Um, but we've seen a resurgence in 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 political life Uh, and as well as big political statements being made like flying planes into buildings so I think it's it's that has formed a catalyst for making us a little bit more loud Hmm. and where does uh, other religions like Scientology come into it is that where you have to uh, feel activism or is that just one you're happy to let lie Uh, no I think uh, I don't uh, as an atheist we're fairly much uh, equal opportunity atheists in that if uh, if it falls into the realm of the supernatural we tend to um, want to 
do something about it, I guess. But it's mostly when it starts to have a bigger political effect that we're more concerned. So when it starts to affect health care or education and things like that. But look, it's got so much going for it. Every religion, I don't care which one it is, is offering something pretty good at the end of your life that sounds really great. Now, if there's a chance that that is the case, that there's this great place called heaven or something at the end of the life that we can trance move beyond our mortal self, wouldn't that be a really good idea to maybe be a part of? Uh, It would be, but it doesn't change what's here and now. Um, Whether there is a life after death doesn't really change what we need to do with the planet here and now and ourselves here and now. Um, And to use that as a a way of uh, not dealing with things here and now today is, I think, a a little bit problematic. And to be honest, I don't think there are many religious people that would do that. Um, And also, I think that the idea of an afterlife is a lot less consoling than people think, in that if you just go to any funeral in any church anywhere, people are not feeling very happy. If you genuinely felt deep in your bones that you were going to a better place and one day you were going to meet them, there would not be that intensity of sadness. Uh, I, I truly believe that um, there is a kernel of doubt in most, peop- in most believers' um, worldview. So do you get many people, um, well, particularly because you've got the high-profile bookshop there, which is, I assume, an atheist bookshop as well? Uh, it's, more, it's not so much an atheist bookshop, although we do have an atheist section, um, unlike most shops. Uh, it's not included in a religious section. Um, We do stock a a wide range of them, but we're more about um, science and philosophy. And we do... The the theme of the shop is actually where science meets art because Mm -hmm. they're the two main ways that people uh, engage in uh, in the world around them. The the two different kinds of approaches is people think of... um, any university departments being split into the sciences and the arts or the humanities and the arts and two different modes of thinking. And, and, and our, our premise for the shop was to cross-pollinate between these two different disciplines. And something that always needs to be mentioned as well is atheist is not anti-theist, is it? No, it isn't. Um, I would probably be along the lines of being anti-theist uh, because I just think there are too many problems with it to ignore. Um, that's not, to, that's not suggesting uh, automatically that we'll have an automatic replacement for them. Um, it's just to suggest that these things are problematic and that in the 21st century, after several hundred years of evidence-based reasoning, that we possibly have something better to replace them with if we just put our minds to it. And what's one of your favourite essays in the book? Oh, there are several. Um, Jane Caro's book... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, essay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her essay is from a uh, feminist perspective. That's right. I like Kylie Sturgis as well. Yeah. Uh, Robin Williams is good. The yes. uh, part-time atheist is yeah. his, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. What, he, he's having a bet each way, is he? No, not really. It's just that it, it's a, more a, a, a conversational piece where he's saying that he ju- it just doesn't cross his mind on a daily basis. Mm. Um, but every now and again, I guess as a science show host, he butts up against... Uh, religious thinking which is contrary to evidence-based thinking and so he will occasionally put on his atheist cap so I think it's a little bit along those lines. Well the recent debate over same-sex marriages I met a few people and when it came down to it I said well, well what's your problem with it and they would say something along the lines well you know it, it's not right according to the Bible and that may be the case the way they interpret the Bible but that also means that you've just given up thinking about the issue for yourself. Yes, and and my big problem with uh, that approach is that the Bible might have maybe three or four lines dedicated to that. That is not enough to make a decision on a a complex ethical issues in the modern society. If like uh, things on abortion and homosexuality and so on, where there is not that much to go on. There's more on not eating shellfish. There's more on on killing your children if they're disobedient. And yet somehow they have the ethical framework to navigate away from those things that they're not all that keen of towards things which support another ideology. And it's that I'm more interested in, in that 
the Bible as itself, if you look at the whole thing. Have you got a favourite book of it? I mean, and this is one thing I like to try and remind people, a lot of atheists do read the Bible because you've got to know what you're not sometimes. And have you got a favourite book? Uh, you know, is there a bit of the New Testament? You know, you, like, <laughs> you know Mark, that's a, he's pretty cool. Uh, Gospel no. of Mark. Uh, Revelations, def- man, there is an acid trip. Yeah, uh, Leviticus. I mean, blood, sex, score. I mean, you've got to go for it, really. I mean, there's a, there's the finest horror movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, you, you're right there. It, it's got it all happening there. Is there an essay in the book that is proving to be controversial that people are sort of coming back and biting you about? Uh, well, the ones that uh, I've most been uh, questioned on so far is the first essay by Chris Stevenson on the, the history of free thought and atheism in Australia. Um, because she's writing, a, a, she's contending with a, a great deal of history which talks about uh, Australia as being a Christian nation, which we're seeing a resurgence of in the popular media at the moment. It's, uh, it simply doesn't seem to bear out when you look at a lot of historical documents, the way history was formed, and where the, the ethos of Australia of mateship and of, of relying on yourself and that individuality, that, that kind of... Um, a part of the Australian psyche which we all seem to love and almost revere really doesn't come from a religious basis and so to talk about a Christian, a Christian nation is um, uh, seems to be quite false and she's working up that into being a, uh, a book at the moment mm. uh, because there's a lot of material. She was only intending to write a short essay um, but then she ended up writing about 20,000 words. <laughs> but at least the Americans give lip service to the separation of church and state. We haven't got that. We've got the Church of England at the top. Yes, that's right. But inst- uh, interestingly, our uh, uh, separation of church and state clause, uh, section 116 of the Constitution, is almost identical to the Americans' uh, separation of church and state clause. They're very, very similar and that's a, funny. I'm, I I never hear of this clause. No, no. It, and yet, it's it's almost identical. But in the test case in America, they uh, the, the test legal case, they ended up ruling in favour of this separation of church and state because it's very clear from the intentions of the founding fathers that's exactly what they intended. Um, and so did ours, pretty much. Um, however, uh, the. Here, our test case was the defence of government schools um, and that ruled in favour of there being some support for religion uh, from, by the state in, in this country. Uh, and look, do you think uh, Richard Dawkins does a little bit more harm than good sometimes, banging around sometimes, hassling uh, theologians um, and gets a bit of a bad name as a smart-ass for the cause sometimes? Because he's certainly, you know, he's the man, he's intellectual, he's got it all going on, Mm. but he also does have a knack of rubbing people the wrong way. Well, I think that's going to be the case almost no matter what you say in the world, you're going to rub someone the wrong way. Uh, Now, there is a very... It's it's very easy to to attack someone when they state their view. And when they state their view with passion, then they present themselves as an easy target. Um, There's a lot of people who say that um, atheists are strident. I think they're strident, arrogant, milligant, militant, uh, fundamentalist and evangelical, and, um, or even religious in their fervour. And, and I, my, yeah, answer, the, my the, answer to all of it... It always gets bo- a smile. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And my answer to all of them is, is bollocks, really. <laughs> um, if, if you take away the meanings of all of those words and supplant them with something else, then perhaps... But um, I always go to the most extreme example of them because it's one we get almost as often, and that is militant. And then you just do a simple thought experiment. Okay, I want you to examine in your mind a, uh, a militant religious person. What do they look like? How do they express themselves? A- and then do the same. I want you to now imagine a, a militant atheist. Which one of these is uh, picking up a gun or strapping bombs to themselves and flying planes into buildings and which one of them is getting a little bit hot under the collar during a debate on TV? It's, it's, not, it's not an appropriate use of the words to describe people who are merely passionately re- representing their points of view uh, as uh, there has been described for Dawkins. I think he's done an extraordinary amount of good, um, not simply because um, of his atheistic stance... Um, 
I think primarily because he's one of the finest science educators I've ever seen. You know, he's, he's done more to promote science in the world than pretty well anyone other than maybe David Attenborough. And what do you hope to achieve with the book? Obviously, you'd like to sell a few copies because you run a bookshop and you might like to do another volume if it goes well, but um, were you trying to think of it as, as being something to maybe get into schools or as, as, a, as a piece of activism? Um, I think it was... Uh uh, a sort of a focusing of attention for a lot of uh, other atheists and agnostics. Um, on, and on and how do they sit? Like, you know, is it like gays and bisexuals? You know, gays think that bisexuals are just people who haven't made up their mind yet. The atheists feel that way about the agnostics? Um, is there a bit of tension? Uh, I think there is. Uh, it, it's largely academic tension um, because most agnostics, when you come down to it, are, are still predominantly atheist. Um, most atheists simply regard their belief as I haven't found evidence uh, that I find compelling to believe in something and agnostics sort of have that same viewpoint um, except they leave it a, the door a little bit more open. So they're more polite? Is that what's going on? Or have they just not decided to pick a side and lose friends yet? <laughs> you might have a point there. I don't really know. I think uh, it's a case-by-case basis. <laughs> <laughs> in San Francisco, California. Richard Saunders here, wishing all listeners to the Skeptic Zone a successful 2011. We've had some major victories in 2010, so let's keep that momentum going. And a big shout-out to all my skeptical podcasting colleagues and friends all around the world. Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Hello everyone and welcome to Dr. Rachie Reports. Well, we're on a bit of a roll here in Australia at the moment with crackdowns on alternative medicine. And there was even more news this week with the announcement of the removal of complementary medicines from sale by the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. In a spot check on around 400 products, 9 out of 10 were found to breach regulations. And as a result, a significant number of products were removed from the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, or the ARTG, which currently lists around 10,250 complementary medicines, including vitamins, minerals and herbal preparations. The breaches, which were largely related to false claims of curative powers on the labels, means the products can no longer be legally sold in Australia. However, which products have been removed was not revealed by the TGA. Now, in Australia, the complementary medicine business is worth over $4 billion a year. But evidence that these products actually work is not required by the TGA before they are assigned an official-looking number and appear on the shelf of your local pharmacy next to aspirin and cough medicine. Instead, the TGA operates a self-assessment online registration system and undertakes post-market reviews, where approximately 25% of products are randomly selected for a review of their labels, product specifications and a summary of their evidence. Now, although the TGA website states, quote, evidence must be held by sponsors which demonstrates the indications and claims are true, valid and not misleading, This latest review suggests this may not always be the case. A second issue for consumers is that even when products are removed from the listing, manufacturers can simply go back online, re-register the product under a different name and effectively get it back on the shelves within 24 hours. So there are two types of drugs and clinical devices controlled by the TGA. There are those which have been evaluated for safety, quality and efficacy and these are designated with a number preceded by AUSTR or OSTR for registered. An example of this kind of product is antibiotics or hay fever medication bought over the counter at the pharmacy or even low risk products such as cough medicines. 
And according to the TGA website, the degree of assessment and regulation they undergo is rigorous and detailed, with sponsors being required to provide comprehensive safety, quality and efficacy data. On the flip side, the AUSTL products, or AUSTL for listed, are called listed products and include complementary and supplementary medicines such as homeopathy, ear candles and detox kits, and many have not gone through clinical testing or indeed have any scientific evidence that they work. Listed medicines are considered by the TGA to be of lower risk than registered medicines, thus they are not assessed for efficacy by the TGA, but only for quality and safety. So clearly the problem here is the TGA's reliance on self-assessment as a means for determining a product's efficacy. But it gets worse when you scrutinise precisely what they define as evidence for these products. So there are two streams of evidence accepted by the TGA, one being scientific and the other traditional use. And traditional use refers to documentary evidence that a substance has been used over three or more generations for a specific health-related or medicinal purpose. Traditional therapies, according to the TGA, include traditional Chinese medicine, traditional Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Western herbal medicine, traditional homeopathic medicine, aromatherapy and other indigenous medicines. Further, there are also increasing levels of evidence within these. So the greater your evidence, the more claims you're entitled to make about your product. For example, three independent written histories of use in the classical or traditional medical literature are acceptable as evidence, and or the availability of your product through any country's government public dispensaries. So this includes chiropractic in Australia and homeopathy in the UK. Now recently the TGA announced a comprehensive review of the way it communicates regulatory processes and decisions to the public, and this is in an effort to improve transparency of the organisation. And the aim of the overhaul is multifaceted, but one aspect is to ensure that the Australian public is better informed about the benefits and risks of therapeutic goods, including all medicines and devices. And in particular, the TGA aims to inform consumers that they do not test OSTL drugs and as such cannot guarantee that they work as claimed. So the TGA will continue to accept OSTL listed products for listing under the clearly flawed self-assessment program and as a method for improving transparency will inform consumers that their system doesn't really work. It's also worth noting that as a consumer, you are free to make a complaint about a TGA-listed product, and if the TGA agrees that this product has breached regulations, the Complaints Resolution Panel will issue a retraction order to the company. However, if the company chooses to ignore the sanctions, the TGA will not enforce them, and between 30 and 50% of companies which get called out for making false claims do ignore these sanctions and the TGA has never made a prosecution for refusing to comply. Now another issue concerning transparency for the general public is the results of an investigation by the TGA do not appear on their website for up to six months. So a consumer searching the web has little chance of knowing that the product is making false claims. Now this black hole where TGA complaints disappear was covered by ABC's Late Line program earlier this year with respect to a homeopathy website that claimed they could cure cancer and AIDS with water. When the story broke, the owner of the website not only continued to ignore the sanctions, but jumped the shark by publishing a response to the story replete with dozens of links which were supposed to justify why their claims were correct. One would hope that the review currently up for public comment will address and correct some of these issues. As it stands, the burden is on the consumer to determine whether a product works or not, as an official-looking OSTL number is apparently no guarantee that the product does what it claims. Although some of the products removed in the recent review were removed for only minor reasons, how the consumer is meant to differentiate between the wrong typeface on the bottle or whether the product actually does what it says is not known. Perhaps the TGA might like to improve their transparency in this case by telling us which products were removed and why. So if the TGA can't guarantee us that these products that they've listed actually work, the next best thing would be to ask a pharmacist, which is where many of these products end up eventually. But from my limited experience, this exercise can also be hit and miss, 
as I've found out when I've asked pharmacists about homeopathy in several pharmacies across Sydney. Some have told myself and Richard Saunders that it's herbal, others don't know what it is, and very few actually understand what homeopathy is. So if you are in Australia, you can submit comment to the TGA review by February 11, 2011. The panel are asking for submissions from health professionals and the general public on several topics, including where it could have been useful for you to have had access to better information about your medicine, supplement or device, and how you would like to have access to that information, whether through your pharmacist or through the internet. I've put all the information about how you can find the websites and make comment on my blog at skepticsbook.com. Happy New Year to all my listeners and thanks for all the feedback in 2010. And until next time, this has been Dr. Rechi Reports. Rational Capital, the podcast for science and scepticism in and about Canberra. Say it like you mean it. There's nothing magical or miraculous about that. (laughs) Find out more at rationalcapital.com.au. Thank you for downloading The Skeptic Zone. On the next show, we've got another surprise guest host and even more great interviews from TAM Australia. I want to share a little bit of news about my new book, Skeptoid 3, Pirates, Pyramids, and Papyrus. It will be available sometime in January 2011. It should be available to Australian buyers, hopefully the end of January, possibly February. Uh, You can get that on Skeptoid.com. It is 50 chapters based on selected Skeptoid episodes and adapted for print. It makes a great gift for people who don't listen to podcasts, which is most people. Check it out, Pirates, Pyramids, and Papyrus. Some very cool topics. I think it's approachable for anyone. It's a great introduction to anyone that you want to ease into the idea of skepticism. I'm also trying something a little bit new in 2011. I'm trying to do crowdfunding for In Fact video episodes. My In Fact video series is also based on selected Skeptoid episodes. They're condensed to about three minutes, ideal for web video. They're suited for general audiences. And again, it's the kind of thing where it's, it's trying to be an introduction to skepticism for people who don't know anything about it, and it's designed to be approachable and friendly for, for any audience. Crowdfunding is where people can come to a website and pledge money to say, hey, I'll give you five bucks, I'll give you 500 bucks, whatever. And if it reaches a certain threshold, then the credit cards are actually charged and the money goes into the production of each episode. If it doesn't reach the threshold, then nobody gets charged anything. So far as I know, don't quote me on that. Anyway, you can get information on that at infactvideo.com. Check it out. I would love to get your support. As for me right now, I'm going back to working on the Skeptoid podcast, skeptoid.com. Subscribe to it on iTunes. Working on some very cool new episodes for 2011. So thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. This is Brian Dunning signing off from Laguna Niguel, California, and wishing all Skeptic Zone and, and Skeptoid listeners a happy and safe 2011. Thank you very much. See you next time. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports. The Skeptic Zone.